Um, I thought to warn you that this video is meant for those who like podcasts or semi-interesting documentaries. Um, it's my first interview video with um, Alma Borales, who is a knitwear designer. Um, and yeah, if you do decide to watch it, uh, it's quite long, but definitely by the end of the day, you will want to knit something. Enjoy! And one of them is a pyjama, actually. <laughs> I want to see. Yeah. I've got this old hand crank singer machine. Um, she's been using that. Uh, and really getting into it. I mean, she's totally, she threads the needle and is totally um, on it. Tell me. Oh, wow. So nice. Oh, it trousers. has trousers. That does look like pajama trousers. So we, she, we made the pants and they were, she was going to bed and she had to put Barbie to bed as well. And then she started to talk about the process. And, uh, and she, she, she was like, look at these, putting the pants on the Barbie. And she said, look at these pants, mom. Like, look how small they are. And then when I put them over the Barbie, on the Barbie, they go over the bum, stretch over the bum, and fit perfectly. That's like magic. And then, um, and then I said, do you know why they... I said, so why do you think that happens? Oh no, something, what did I say? I said, because it's a knitted fabric. And then I said, try this bed sheet. Uh, if you pull the bed sheet this way, e -e, and that way, e -e, it doesn't work, it doesn't stretch compared to the knitted fabric. But then, and then I said, but if you fold it diagonally like this, try now. And she went boing, boing. And then she went, what did you say? But that was magic, and then she was like, <laughs> "So much magic in this world." Hello, everyone who's listening, and I'm here today with Maya, who's the world famous uh, knitwear designer. Hello, everyone who's listening, and I've got my little assistant here, Alma. You can do this. Hello. Little shy <laughs> assistant. Yes. For now. For now, yeah. I'm just fixing her um, her mask. Yeah, thank you, Leanne, for having me in your discussions. This is exciting what you're doing. I had a little look on your video and um, it's brilliant. It's great to start this conversation and it's great to start this conversation at... Um, I think now is a really good time to discuss these things when we are at home and we can um, really we can really kind of dwell into what's in our houses that we could utilize for making stuff. Do you want to tell a bit about yourself and what you're doing now? Um yeah, so um so so um I'm um I founded my company Alma Borealis um, as a kind of response to, um, well, it's like a, a, a research lab for kids wear to find the ultimate environmentally, the most environmentally friendly and educational garment uh, for, for kids. I find that in kids wear that we buy at the moment from the shops for our children, there's very little, um, there's very little opportunity to express or the child doesn't have much say in how and what they're wearing or how that piece is designed. The whole, the whole chain looking at kids were uh, that piece of clothing is the concept, the brands decided the, the trends, the, an adult who are adults, the adult has designed the garments, the adult, uh, buys the garment for that child and so uh, that child is kind of offered this thing on a plate and I'm kind of mm. I dug into it and I just kind of felt like there's so much learning opportunity in there for a child for anybody really for us adults as well I mean have you 
you probably have as you are in this field of textiles and fashion, but how many people have cut up an old piece of got, got clothing to see, you know, how it's made up, you know, what kind of pieces it's made up? Because actually it's not very complex. Um, they're flat pieces that are put together, you know, two squares and you get a, you get a top. I'm wondering uh, when you do the garments for kids, how far do you go? So how far do they can choose the, the manufacturing process of the garments? Is it like they choose the yarn or the panel? Um, the kids um, can choose the, the panels, the colors, uh, the sizes and the shapes and the textures. So I do that because I'm thinking about ribbed structures or whether they're sort of non-ribbed. Non so uh, the fabrics are in themselves quite plain I haven't got to as far as the children being able to use, uh, choose their yarn, but what I give them is, it's, it's almost like a, this puzzle that they can choose the pieces for. Um, and what's quite exciting is that it is a puzzle that turns into a three dimensional puzzle that they can then fit inside. Um, so it's taking the concept of a piece of clothing and kind of breaking it down and giving it um, maybe some new, maybe a new view of, um, of seeing it, of, of looking at it. How about the fabric itself? How about the materials themselves? Do you give choice in that? And do you have like noticed that, that, I don't know, they prefer more natural materials or synthetic or what's the choice in that? Or? Currently, um, we are using British wool only. So I'm looking, I've, I've done a hefty bit of research into what's the softest and nicest uh, and not itchy uh, wool and, and washable and wearable and durable and um, as local as possible. Say a child got um, as a present the convertibles kit that's made out of wool so there can be some discussion over that so where does this material what how does that material feel where does it come from and what happens to it at the end of its life i think i think those kind of conversations would be really interesting to have even just shop bought clothes that um we buy sort of every day or, or charity shop or wherever you, you buy your clothes. But just to kind of look at, you know, just initiate that conversation with, with young children so that they grow up yeah. with thinking of, okay, we don't, this, it has been made by somebody. And like you said, in your video introduction, it's been, you know, the fiber has been grown, it's been processed, it's been, it's been, it's been washed, it's been, washed multiple times, finished, chemicals have been poured onto it, cut, so on, all that kind of shebang. So I'm kind of just sort of wanting to get this conversation going so that the future generations don't take their clothes for granted, but they get this understanding that a lot of energy, a lot of labor has gone into, into making these pieces. And so we probably ought to give them some value. Do you see, how do you see it being translated to adults? Do you think there's still hope for adults right now? Or you think it's like too far beyond into kind of fashion and what we're used to? Yeah, hope. I think there's always hope as long as we're breathing. It's a very important matter, but whether it is in your, on your priority list to look into your, um, the, the contents of your wardrobe and analyze where they come from where who made them and what's happening afterwards that's another matter and the other thing is um yeah so whether you have that as your priority or whether you have feeding your four children as your priority so again it's almost like that conversation needs to be extended um somehow extended to the people who don't have the time to think about it. Do yeah. You know what I mean? It's at the moment the conversation is in the hands of the people who are either in the business or studying or or have time. Which um, is a luxury. Which is a luxury, yeah. I mean I'm I don't have any time, but I am 
lucky. I don't know if that's the word, right word, but I'm lucky to be in that field of researching this topic of uh, designing garment concepts so that it, I am involved in that discussion and I am thinking about that most days, most times actually. But, um, but, that's, but I don't have the time. If I didn't have, if I wasn't in it, in the field, um, I don't think I would be thinking about it. It's really, it's a convenience thing and the fast fashion brands have made it so convenient um, for people to buy so much so quickly that, um, that um, it has become this, this commodity that we just pass through our hands without really considering what's what the, the the kind of the the energy bank the the energy the human energy and the 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 natural energy that's in this item that we all wear you know if we stop and go whoa you know how many liters of water you know how much electricity how much gas how much oil how much human hour labor hours yeah, because it, all of these things comes from the understanding of actually how garments are made in general. Um, and on that note, I have seen your videos of knitting at home with pencils. And I want to know what, what's the idea behind that and how did you start that and, and what's planned next? Uh, yeah, so uh, as I didn't have enough um, things to do in my life. I decided that well prior to this um, This situation that we're in now. I was running kids workshops in knitting machine learning um, so I would um, I would take my my kit of knitting machines um, into venues various venues uh, around the country and set them up and get kids knitting on um, on the machines they would mostly make their own scarves but they would have that experience of manufacturing something that looks pretty sort of uh, factory made if I may say so sort of finished fine knits that um, would take a long time to knit by hand so they would also get to design their um, their own scarves so they had first-hand experience of the process so Obviously, these came to a standstill with the social distancing. So I felt like it was, I wanted to maintain some kind of contact still with the communities that I've been working with. But what about the materials that you use? Because you use quite waste materials, I guess. So the whole, the idea of was, I, I thought, okay, I'll do some hand, because I can't get machines to people and I don't assume that people have machines, which is what I normally do. But uh, um, I thought I'm going to create a series of online tutorials and then I thought well what if uh, people didn't get to the shops the knitting shops on time what if they didn't but what, what if they don't have knitting needles and wool and uh, yarn at their in their homes and I thought well that's not a problem we can use pencils so um so I was thinking okay what is long and straight and a bit pointy and I'm using these I'm using these um blunt pencils which have now all that paint's worn off because I've been knitting so much with these. Oh wow. Um, they kind of they began they they're molding, they're shaping, they're they're softening. They were a bit brittle and there were a few kind of pokey bits there, which are not great because they can snag into your knitting. But they're now shaping nice and smooth, a bit like water shaping rocks. They're basically becoming knitting needles themselves. They are. They're evolving into knitting needles. So, and I've got these lobby bits here to stop. Um, you can see that on my videos. Um, I've got, there's a, uh, at one point I had two nuts on here as well, which looks really smart. But then I, I did a test on what, if you don't have nuts available, you could just do sellotape or anything, or even a bit of blue tag or something. To stop your knee, you can get more, more stitches on your needles if you don't, if they don't fall off. So they're, they're quite, you're a bit limited if you don't have anything at the end of your needles. Oh, here I go into the detail now, but, <laughs> but yeah, might as well make this a tutorial, eh, Lenny? So, and then what I've been doing is, um, so for the wool, so normally we would go to the wool shop and get some lovely wool. Um, 
And so what if we don't have any of that accessible? We can order online, of course, but I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to see, um, you know, get some kind of uh, material knowledge and fiddle with your recycling bin, you know, look into your closet, uh, your wardrobe and see what you can make into yarn. So anything that you can cut into a really long strip does the job. So I have, for example, cut, I won't advertise, so um, this is like one of those um, Tomato? You, yeah, tomato, passata, chopped tomato, tetra pack thing. So it's mm -hmm. got that foil on the inside. So, and this is a really complex uh, material to recycle because it's got, it's got a layer of plastic, it's got a layer of foil, and then it's got glue, and then it's got the cardboard over the top. So, so really, I mean, is this really going to be recycled? Oh, it says widely recycled. That's interesting. But what I, I do even more, and so I just so I cut that into into really fine strips. This is quite stiff, so it's quite hard to knit or or, or crochet when it's um, when it's it's thicker. So I cut it really really fine, and now I've got this kind of lovely foily sparkly material that I can use, which seems really luxurious. And I'm I have been experimenting with crisp packets. Hopefully you will see me in my next video. Um, but yeah, I have been cutting up crisp packets and I find the material quite interesting. Like it kind of balances when you knit it and it kind of, yeah. you kind of almost, it looks like a little bit like a dress. There's something about this shiny party dress feel to it. Yeah. yeah. Check yeah. this out. That's coffee package. And I mean, Wow. Like, wow, you know, I, 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 you know, it's just a rectangle-ish, but I love it. It's like, I'm like a magpie. I'm like, wow, you know, that's from my recycling bin and I've made it into something glamorous, you know, that could be a glamorous uh, wristband. It's a bit scratchy. I think the crisp packets are probably a bit less scratchy than this. This is a bit, this has got a bit of a, mm -mm. but I think if I cut it again, I cut this quite wide. Mm. So... I think you can, if I cut it less wide, it's probably be a bit softer. So I've experimented with uh, coffee packaging. Then I've done some paper bag knitting, uh, which has been amazing. Oh, wow. Although, so this is really quite tricky because it does snap. Yeah, paper, so you, have to, you have to kind of knit it like with this lightness. You just knit it really lightly and you don't put any pressure on it. And then I managed to do this bit, but um, it is a bit annoying to knit. But the fact that I've made a stretchy thing, whoa, out of a paper bag, I'm pretty chuffed with. So that's really cool. Um, oh yeah, and I made this. This is my recent one. I thought I'd do a bit more paper knitting. Something went down. Yeah, my, oh, my shears and everything. So I made a little neckerchief. Oh wow! Out of it, so it curls because it's just one. It's just plain knit. But so I made a little neckerchief out of paper paper packaging. So I thought that's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. I might have to at the end there so that it stays its shape. Keeps, have you so thought to process them as like finishing methods or something? Because I'm planning to. I haven't done it yet, but I'm planning to iron my crisp packets. Oh yeah, and then you could melt it together. Yeah, like kind of get, like I quite like the bouncy effect, but I'm just thinking, because I'm making a pajamas, right? So I, I should get it to um, like a softer level. Oh, wow, that's amazing, like a crown. That's really nice. I mean, and listen to this. Yeah, the sound of it. Like rustling autumn leaves. I have to say, when working with the crisp packets, I have got used to the crisp packet sound in my house so much at one point it got like oh my god like please like just be quiet for a moment because it's just constant shh. yeah you should record that actually you could just tune with it i think if you if you've got any plastic in there it's just going to melt so you're probably going to lose the stretchiness and i'm really savoring this i'm making something stretchy out of you know this 
is paper packaging and it stretches. Yeah, quite amazing. That, that, manip that transformation of something solid and, and like these, when I get to knit these, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, I'm, I'm transforming this solid, hard, non malleable, non malleable item into something that I, I give a new kind of totally new texture to, and I, I'd be really excited to see what the results of that is, and mm. um, because it might work for some other, maybe you don't want that flex in some areas. And also, I've been thinking about washing it. So maybe the, with the wash, it will get softening up because at some point it has to like, I mean, it's, it's I know it's like, um, with, we're working with the artificial materials, but they, they still would be able to break down the more you, like even crisp packet, if you actually like work it a lot, it gets softer and it kind of starts to break down. Yeah, like my, I noticed that the more I've been, cause I've been really like squidging my first paper, but I've been just loving this. Um, and I think actually Alma was like really, she was really enjoying pressing into it. I think it's lost its oomph, you know, it's kind of flattened down now a bit. Um, it's kind of looks a bit like, it looks like it's been driven over. It looks like it's been ironed. So yeah. previously it was like this or so lovely and fluffy. You mm. know, this is like, you know, this is wearable-ish. Yeah. There's times in the in the night when I'm about to go to bed when I've done my actual work, um, um, but I kind of go, oh, but look at those pencils there. They're calling my those pencils, and I've got something on there, and I really want to hear that, like you were saying about your crisp packets. I just want to get into that zone for a bit, and then I end up knitting for a couple of hours more into the night, just because it it's just that nice peaceful moment of. Um, to myself I don't know what's going to come out of these actually I'm thinking about um, I am thinking about having an output at the end of the tutorial so we're now in episode two and I'm just about to uh, bring out the the part two the knitting part episode one was about materials and and gathering them and finding what you could use in the house and then the episode two is the actual knitting so we've got Part one is cast on, part two is knitting, and part three is cast off. But I had an idea that um, actually it wasn't me who had the idea, it was my friend Sinead, who's been an amazing mentor for me actually throughout this whole thing. She's like, oh my God, try this, try that, try that. Or oh, what about that? Oh, I'm gonna do this with my boy's trousers. Or oh, I've cut up, he's cut up all, she's cut up all his, um, all her son's old trousers and she's made a rug, out, knitted a rug out of it. It's brilliant. It's a bit like the rug that you, started to crochet with all the strips from uh, Loch Aaron. Yeah. Uh, so I'm thinking for the end, I, I, I ramble on quite a lot, don't I, I go off the topic. But it's all, it's all part of it, it's all, part, it's all linked. So I was thinking if everybody would make one piece, one, one panel of their choice during this lockdown, um, um, and attach a little note on it and describe and describe their feelings, how they're feeling in the lockdown. And what were they feeling when they knitted that piece? Um, and if they would post those pieces to me and Sinead, and what we're going to do is we're going to try and raise some funds for this community, uh, community gym that promotes um, mental health through fitness in, in Edinburgh. We're trying to link with them and, get some funds for them to keep going because they're, they're, they're facing cuts in their funding and it might be that they, they're, they're not gonna be able to continue um, doing this really important work that they're doing. So what we'd like to do is create this huge installation piece. Um, this charity has a, um, this gym um, has a huge warehouse where they operate. And we are seeing this amazing um, installation piece filled with lots of little pieces, uh, almost like a community quilt. Oh, maybe that's what it could be called, a community quilt. And we see what people are feeling. I'm so that's great, um, brilliant. 
I'm going to share your um, your videos and for people who are interested to follow you as well. Great. And also definitely for for um, knitting itself. I think you have actually really nice, like accessible videos to how to learn knitting actually. Can I ask you last question? What do you think would will be the future of clothing and fashion and what do you think the direction it will take in the future i know it's incredibly broad question incredibly tricky and there are so many there's so many innovations going in different directions some of them kind of linking uh but some of them not really i just think what, what is your kind of maybe broad opinion or our opinion at this exact moment because i know they do change um of where we are heading or or where at least textile or even kids wear is heading? Um, well, I think, I think, uh, yeah, it's really broad. Um, what's happening at the moment is that there's loads of new initiatives, uh, startup companies like my company as well, where we're in a position that we can we can start off kind of clean we can start off we will start off and we'll 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 we've got principles that we we is are our foundation like my company has started from a, a recognized need for something different um that's hopefully going to engage people in conversation about this so small companies are in a position or startups are into in a position where they can enter the market um, with, uh, with a clean plate. It, the problem is these already established gigantic companies who rely on producing zillions of pieces of clothing every year. So, their model is based on the consumption so basically and that's the problem we're consuming too much it's really hard for the consumer to stop consuming if you a don't have time b don't have money and you're offered a really cool garment at a really low cost do you think this can change by the way how we make garments themselves like in the in the manufacturing processes because one of the aims of my project is to see if we can eliminate these processes and if if the whole kind of manufacturing can get easier if can, can it be you know all all of these new innovations of just growing the fiber from and you grow it into the shape you have no waste you have no no processing or the processing is fairly little you think that's something that will expand or do you think it's still like a niche that that will be there you know kind of always a niche and it's up to the big companies to just kind of make their processes sustainable or uh, no i think that the consumer is going to have a bigger and bigger role in the making of their own garments or at least designing of them you know you've got these maker spaces where you can download a pattern and take it to a maker space and they'll either laser cut it for you or or 3d print it for you and yes it is a niche at the moment but i think it's going to trickle down further and further but um but yes, currently it's sitting at this middle market where it is usually, it, uh, I would say, I mean, this is a generalization, but I think it's for the people who are in the know. And so I think that's the challenge. You know, it's all fine creating this new stuff for the consumer who's already aware, but really the educating from the bottom up is what we need to do. I um, mean, clothing education um, in primary schools, so if we, for example, start taking initiative and, and talking about circular economy, um, I mean, and this doesn't just apply to clothing, this really applies to the, all of the industries, all of the products that we use. Um, if we start um, delivering um, educational packages to primary schools and, and really organise the 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 learning so that the future generations grow up having this this thinking of sustainability and not not wasting resources 
basically we need to reach everybody so maybe um, that's, that's the role of youtube maybe that's the role of the videos we're doing yeah. um to reach yeah, everybody if we're aiming to approach everybody we need to be everybody uh, we need to approach them from a level where they can talk to us they can um sorry The Barbie clothes that you buy from the shop, I'm just going to say it, okay? I don't, I'm not worried about Mattel um, getting after me because I've got every reason to say that the Barbie clothes that you buy, I don't know how much you pay for them. We've never bought any. But I have to, I, I'm going to investigate this, actually. They are unrealistically... Um, shit. Probably. <laughs> shit. Can I say that? Yeah. You said it. Like, I mean... You can say whatever. Uh, like yeah like fast fashion is shit but i mean barbie clothes so maybe maybe what she could start is a barbie clothes revolution you know don't buy any barbie clothes you can make them yourself you know if you don't have a sewing machine you can hand stitch them better than what they're made you know in the in the in the shops yeah it's unbelievable Ooh, maybe there could be like a I wonder if you could do yoga knitting could you do somehow multitask and <laughs> some kind of fit of a fitness activity whilst you're knitting I mean I'm not saying that well no knitting isn't really promoting fitness is it I mean you can't well unless you're doing your pelvic floor as you're knitting Engaging your malabanda. That is true. It's like all knitters have done it. Yeah, we could do it. We could do that. That could be a really good. Um, that would be a really good fundraiser. We'll do a Zoom. Malabanda uh, knitting to raise funds for this charity. That's it. I'm going to write that down. I think this week you will see me in my, my um, Chris Packet attempts. Let's put it that way. How many Chris Packets do you estimate that you'll need to create pajamas? I was thinking about this morning after you sent me your video, I was thinking, I wonder how many packets of crisps, is she gonna eat them all? Watch my next video, I will tell you about it. <laughs> 